right, so let's talk about the second derivative. And actually, we're going to kind of summarize some information from the first derivative that we've already discussed. First of all, we know that if the derivative is positive on an interval, then f is increasing on that interval. And we know that if the derivative is negative on an interval, then f is decreasing on that interval. If the derivative is zero at some value of x, then f has a horizontal tangent line at that value of x. If f prime equals zero at some value of x, then that means that f always, sometimes, or never has a maximum or minimum. And the answer is going to be sometimes, because think about a parabola. There's, a, there's definitely a turning point at the horizontal tangent line. But here's an idea. What about x cubed? This is the cubic function, which actually has a horizontal tangent line right at the origin, but is not a turning point. So just because there is a horizontal tangent line does not mean that there is a max or a min. Now let's talk about the second derivative. And we alluded to this when we graphed our derivative graph a couple of slides ago. If the second derivative is positive on an interval, that means that f prime is increasing, which means that f is concave up on that interval. If the second derivative is negative, then f prime is decreasing on the interval, and f is going to be concave down. And if f double prime is 0 on some value of x, then the function always, sometimes, or never has a point of inflection. And that is going to be sometimes, let's see, something like uh, this cubic function has a point of inflection here at the origin, where it shifts from concave down to concave up. But think about a constant function or any kind of linear graph. The second derivative will be 0 because there is no concavity on this function. And if you think about it, the derivative of this function would be just a positive y value, say y equals 1. And then the derivative of a constant line is 0. So just because the second derivative is 0 does not mean that there is a point of inflection. So the next task that you have to do is pretty tricky, and it's going to take you quite some time. This is something that if we were doing in class, it would take a good 20 minutes, and it would take a lot of collaboration. So I want you to be patient with yourself and go through each of the four graphs. And I want you to, in red, sketch the graph of the first derivative and then the second derivative in blue. And then, of course, I will walk you through how to do each of them. So go ahead and hit pause and then come back and check your answers. OK, so let's take a look at the first two here. What we have is a piecewise function that has a negative slope and then a second piece that has a positive slope here. It looks to me like we can actually calculate this slope here. So it goes from the point negative 3, 3 to the point 3, 0. So that slope is negative 1 half, which is why in red we drew a horizontal line with a, uh, at y equals negative 1 half. For this second piece, we have a slope of 1, so we draw in y equals 1. Notice how we were very careful at the endpoints of each of these segments to put in an open circle. Here's what you need to know. At, y equal, at x equals 3, there is not going to be a defined slope on the derivative because of the disconnect here. Coming in from the left and coming in from the right, there are different slopes. The endpoints, we don't worry about. Frankly, we don't discuss differentiability or whether there's a derivative that is defined at endpoints at all. So if you did not put open holes here on the endpoints, you would never be graded down for that. It is important that you put them in here where there was this disconnect in the slopes. And then next, the slope of this horizontal line and the slope of this horizontal line are both zero. So your second derivative in blue is this horizontal line with a gap or a hole here at x equals 3. And that gap is required because if the first derivative is undefined, then the second derivative is also undefined. Next, we have an upside down parabola. We drew in a graph with a slope of, it looks like, um, 
negative three halves, which is fine. Yours could have negative two. Yours might, it could be slightly different from this. As long as you have a consistently decreasing function, I've often seen students put in some concavity. That's fine too. You have no way of knowing if this is actually going to be linear or if it will have concavity because you don't have the equation of this curved graph. This is a good representation of an always decreasing graph. It needs to be always decreasing because the original function is concave down, so its derivative is decreasing, and the function increases then decreases, so the derivative goes from positive to negative. Then you take the function in red, and we went ahead and calculated it as a slope of negative 3 halves, so we put in the horizontal line at negative 3 halves for the second derivative. All right, let's take a look at the next two. The original graph in black, this is one that I strongly recommend that you do piece by piece. So I would first go ahead and plot in the zeros of my derivative function wherever I have horizontal tangent lines on the original graph. So that's why we plugged in zeros here, here, and here. Then I'm going to take a look at each, uh, I'm going to take a look for the inflection points as well. It looks like I have inflection points around here and around here. And then just go section by section where the graph is decreasing and concave up. The derivative is going to be increasing but negative. Where the graph is increasing and concave up, the derivative will be increasing and positive. Wherever the graph is concave down, the derivative decreases. The graph was increasing, derivative positive, graph decreasing, derivative negative. Next section, I still have a decreasing function here, concave up now, so the derivative is increasing but negative. And then the last bit, my function is increasing and concave up, so the derivative is positive and increasing. Then what you need to do is take a look at your derivative function in red and determine where it has horizontal tangent lines. And I'm going to change my color so it appears. Horizontal tangent lines in two places. So that is where my second derivative will have x-intercepts. Looking at the function in red, red is increasing and concave down. So blue is positive and decreasing. Then red is decreasing for an interval, so blue is below the x-axis. Switching from concave down to concave up, so the second derivative goes from decreasing to increasing. And then the derivative function, the red function, is increasing and concave up, so the blue function, the second derivative, is positive and increasing. Last graph over here, I do the same thing. I look for horizontal tangent lines on my original function. And this is really tricky, but I don't count any of this as a horizontal tangent line. I say that this is always decreasing. Um, looks like Mr. Walker, when he drew this, he might have said, oh, let's put a horizontal tangent line in here. So he has two x-intercepts. Either way is fine. It's just so hard to tell. Um, I know I have an inflection point here. So I go from concave down to up and then to down again. So these two places where I have x's, I'm going to have um, turning points on my derivative. So you can see that my function was increasing and in concave down. So my derivative is positive but decreasing. And then you'll find that I follow the concavity, concave down, then up, then down. So my derivative decreases, increases, decreases. And then moving from the red to the blue is slightly easier because I have uh, two turning points on the first derivative, so two x-intercepts on the second derivative. And then I only have one inflection point on the first derivative, so one turning point on the second derivative. 